Hello and welcome to another edition of Deal Hunter. We've got a great one for you today. I'm Mitch Flax, your co-host. Alongside, we've got Tom Staub. Good to see you, pal. Yes, sir. How you doing? I am phenomenal. Uh, New Year, uh, same me, and a little skinnier these days, and dry January feels pretty decent. Yeah. Wow. I'm missing beer, though. Yeah. (laughs) We've got a special guest today, Michael Zuber, who is the author of One Rental at a Time, which also shares the name of your podcast. Find him on YouTube, close to 24,000 subscribers. I've learned a ton from you, Michael Zuber. (laughs) Do we call you Zuber or Michael or both? Well, we're friends now. So all my friends call me Zuber. Uh, you know, there are frankly too many Michaels in this world. Zuber is unique. So uh, I'll go by that if you don't mind. Thank you so much for spending some time with us this morning. Uh, We hope that our listeners are going to just get a ton of information on why real estate, the advantages to actually having real estate in your portfolio. And uh, we'll talk about some of the disadvantages. So things to be aware of. Sure. I love it. Well, one of the first things that, you know, I think real estate, specifically as a direct investment, I think a lot of folks think that they've got access uh, to real estate in their portfolio, perhaps from their home, which really isn't an investment, although it could be. A lot of people don't realize it really is probably your biggest liability unless it's something that's actually income producing. But Mm -hmm. the other folks, you know, I come from a Wall Street background primarily in the distribution of financial products. Mm -hmm. And most of my clients still today are those financial advisors. And I think a lot of folks that think that they might have exposure to real estate through some of those mutual funds that they owned or some tradable and non-tradable REITs. Mm -hmm. And so we'd like to kind of get into that a little bit, but um, We'll talk about five really advantages to owning real estate, and then we'll lay out three disadvantages. So yeah, the, one of the first advantages I think that a lot of people don't realize is the absolute return. It's not just about cash flow or appreciation, but absolute return really takes into account depreciation as well as you know any potential losses that you can carry year to year. Guys, Tom or Zuber, yeah, what do you Mitch, guys think about like the too, absolute right? return aspect as part of uh, the benefits of real estate? Yeah, I'll let Zuber uh, comment, but I do, I, I, it, we have to talk about his background briefly. So maybe like 30 seconds, Zuber, just give us a high level who you are and what you've done today. Yeah, so my background is kind of the rat race on steroids. I, uh, I believe you go to school, get a good education so you can make a lot of money. That's what I did. Got an, you know, went, got an undergraduate degree, got an uh, MBA, made a bunch of money, but spent it all. I didn't get it, right? I increased my lifestyle as my income went up. Uh, I went ahead and invested in the stock market during the dot-com craze. Yes, I'm nearly 50. So that's where I cut my teeth. I turned seven grand into 200, only to lose 80% of that in the crash uh, because I became a speculator, but still called myself an investor. So some folks out there listening may be going through this for the first time today. It's kind of weird that we're revisiting this again as we go from a bull to a bear market where pain is ensuing. Uh, but after losing 80% or $160,000, which is more money than my family had ever seen, I go through a physical bookstore. I bump into a purple book that we now call Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and it sent me on another direction. So over the next 15 years, I built up a real estate portfolio while holding a demanding full-time job in a market that's two and a half hours away. I've had property management since day one, no special access, all out of the MLS. Was buying starting in 02, which if you know the real estate market means pre-crash. I got out of my houses at the peak because I was watching affordability, 1031 into apartments, raised a bunch of private money during the crash. And lo and behold, we replaced two six-figure incomes at the 15-year mark and have been given back since then. So I've been in real estate for 21, 22 years. So that's my background. Awesome. And then, uh, yeah, so definitely a seasoned investor in real estate mogul, if you will. But, um, (laughs) (laughs) so, But back to the absolute return. I have my take, but Zuber, what is your take? Well, again, so I have the unfair advantage of being 20 some years into this. One of the things that really suffers for new real estate investors, right? If that's your primary focus, is it's so slow those first couple of years, right? 
oh, I scrounge up 10, 15, 20 grand. I put it down. I get my rental. It cash flows 100 bucks. It doesn't move the needle. You're right. It doesn't move the needle. And in fact, it probably won't move the needle for five years. I want you to plan for that. But then something amazing happens with real estate once you realize that time in the market beats timing the market. First, you have mortgage pay down. Then you have this wonderful thing called inflation. Yes, I said wonderful. You have both asset inflation and rent inflation. If you follow my one rental at a time strategy, you have fixed rate debt. So your debt structure stays. Yes, you have insurance going up and taxes, but for the most part, your, your cost or expense structure is the same. So somewhere between year three and year six, you will have some opportunities to recycle capital. This was a huge piece of my uh, retirement. We recycled stuff via a cash out refi. We did 1031 exchanges. We did burrs. There are so many ways that you can reuse capital. So for example, that first $20,000 I put down on Norris Drive has been recycled three or four times. That is now 23 or 24 units, half a million dollars in equity and a hundred grand in the bank. So when you think total return with real estate, you have to think time because too many people go, oh, I struggle. It's hard to get a down payment. And then I get a hundred bucks, 300 bucks, 400 bucks. It doesn't change my life. Real estate won't change your life in five years. But if you do it for 10 years, shoot, you'd be shocked. I believe most people can make work optional if you give it 10 years. So that's, that's kind of my thoughts and, and happy to go any direction you want. Yeah. And I just, uh, can, you know, create a more concise, 100% equity pay down, which essentially is your tenant paying down your mortgage, right? Mm-hmm. That's always nice. You have inflation, you know, the three to 5% typically each year. <laughs> um, you have the cash flow from rents. Sometimes in this market, hard to come by, but they're still mm-hmm. out there. And then you have the tax write offs. And we'll avoid that topic for this conversation, but I think a lot of investors focus on top line and cash flow, mm-hmm. and, but they miss the tax part of it. And that, that's a huge element too. Um, and we had Brandon Hall on during my conference. And I asked him, what is the most tax advantage asset to own? He said, without a doubt, real estate. Oh, it used yeah. to be oil and not, and not gas, mm-hmm. um, but it's 100% now real estate. So, Mitch, what do you think I about completely that? agree with you. I think, you know, that's exactly how I've built my net worth. You know, a guy that's been involved in publicly traded investment products for almost 20 years, hmm. you would think that most of my net worth would come from that. You- and- In the last eight years since I've been building my own personal real estate portfolio, I am able, if I sold all my assets, which I won't, but if I would be able to essentially, you know, dictate my future without ever having to go work for anybody else, unless I really wanted to. And so I think that power is, is immense. And it, you know, one of the things that you mentioned was, you know, doing those cash out refis and, you know, frankly, you know, I, I'll always preface this. I may not be the smartest, but I certainly got in at the right time because, you know, it really has been phenomenal. I don't claim to be an expert in real estate. There's a bit of it that I've gotten lucky with the appreciation in the housing and certainly with where mortgage rates have been. And it just has allowed me to not just do a cash out refi, but actually get a better rate. And then you take that money and you replicate yeah, the exact you know, same thing. So it's been quite nice. Yeah. And, and, and Mitch, not to get too complex here, but I think for all listeners, check out something called the sharp ratio, which is kind of a traditional way of looking at portfolios. It basically is a way to measure risk and return. And if you look at the linearity of real estate versus stocks, yes, we had the 08 crash, but without a doubt, real estate is way more linear. Uh, the volatility is way lower than stocks. And generally, um, you're still looking at a 12 to 18% annual return when you factor all these things together pretty easily. You know, it's, it's pretty hard to argue to not have real estate as part of your portfolio. Let's talk about inflation. Zuber, you talked about it. it. Interesting article that actually came out yesterday from Bloomberg. We are experiencing quite a bit of uh, inflation. In fact, uh, I think a 40-year high, uh, according to this article that came out yesterday on Bloomberg. Mm -hmm. Um, Interesting facts. Wages and real estate are absolutely correlated. And over the last 100 years, not only has it kept up with inflation, but real estate has actually surpassed it by 2 to 3%, according to Colin Lazeri, who's an economist and professor 
at the University of Cambridge. So what are some of your thoughts, Tom or Zuber, around the hedge and the protection that real estate can provide against inflation? I think it's probably the, the ultimate gauge. And, and I didn't do 100 years of research, but something I did about six or nine months ago is I did 50, I, what I created a 50-year spreadsheet, which goes back all the way to 1970. Uh, because I was afraid even nine months ago that we were going to enter an inflation period. And the normal thinking is, and correct me, guys, tell me if you've heard this before. If interest rates go up 1%, real estate crashes 10%. How many of you have heard that? Have you, have you heard that kind of rule of thumb? I haven't heard it per, per se. I've heard something like it in the stock market, but yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of talking heads that say, hey, if rates go up 1%, real estate falls 10%. And they always point at the 08 crash is, is kind of their logic. So I don't like rules of thumb. Generally speaking, I'm a data guy. So I said, all right, let's go back to 1970. Why 1970? That was the last time we had real inflation, right? North of 2%. So I did. I went all the way back to 1970. And let me just ask these questions. So first and foremost, in the 1970s, rates went up 300 basis points. 300, not 30, 300. So normally speaking, that's supposed to crash real estate 30%. Because again, it, it's more, it's unaffordable, right? Rates went up. Okay, great. Uh, what, what else happened? Well, first and foremost, real estate doubled. That's not supposed to happen. It's not supposed to happen. Why did it happen? Wages. And you hit it. Wages. So many people talk about real estate today like, oh my God, the price is higher today than 06 or 07, pick your year. Those people are uninformed and are idiots. Next, they go, oh, boy, it's price and payment. Because again, interest rates, right? We have, we have rates going up and we have values going up, albeit slower, but still going up. It's none of those two things. It's the combination of price, rate, and wages. Wages nearly doubled. And yes, wages, I think, went up 87% from memory. Uh, real estate went up 103%, even though rates went up 300 basis points. Nothing else did well. S&P 500 went up one point in a decade. Real estate did okay. That's phenomenal information. Yeah. Um, geez, inflation. I mean, I think everyone knows owning assets during inflationary periods is a good thing, right? And, you know... A lot of people got rich. And the cash flowing assets are even better. Oh man, phenomenal, right? Um, so long as you're recycling that cash, not mm -hmm. keeping it in the bank. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of money right now being, being made from those ha who, had, who owned assets. And I think that will be the case for the next you know, seven to eight years. Yeah, I mean, just go back and look at it. I mean, Google is a wonderful machine if people would take the time to use it. Go look at the S&P 500 from, I think it was 73 to 82. It went up a point. It actually might have went down a point. I forget if it was up one or down one. That's a decade of dead money. Yeah, sure. You could be a stock picker and do all that stuff. I'd much rather be fuck freaking lazy, right? Yeah. My real estate doubled. And oh, by the way, then we had 40 years of declining rates. To Mitch's point, I can go back and refi and get a better payment. And my rents doubled. I mean, it's just... The sharp ratio. I mean, just look at yesterday. What a yeah. crazy <laughs> market, right? Like, Down 1,100, up 100. <laughs> yeah, real estate doesn't shift like that. You know, you have six to 12 months before you see some substantial... You know, and I want to I want to hit that hard because again I wrote about it in my book. Right, I survived the crash because I looked at my market every day. I was trying to buy my ninth house. It was unaffordable. It would produce negative cash flow. So I looked around and I found small commercial units that cash flowed like crazy because they were underappreciated. So I 1031 eight houses into 80 units, and was fine. Yes, my net worth went down, but I don't spend my net worth. My cash flow went up because what people don't realize is the single family housing market fell 75% in my market. Rents went up. Rents went up. So here's the other thing too, that a lot of folks do not think about. You look at the cost of materials mm -hmm. to build homes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Naturally they go up. Here's what, this is why stocks have been a great inflationary hedge as well. Well, naturally, do you think corporations are going to eat that spread between the cost of goods to produce and, and, and what it ultimately is going to be on the market for, whatever the product is? 
No, I mean, look at Chipotle. Chipotle gave us the answer. I think it was 14 months ago. They were celebrated for raising minimum wage. I think it was to $15 early in this cycle. They were celebrated. A week later, or maybe it was 10 days later, the price of my burrito bowl went up 9%. That's what's going to happen. They'll, they'll eat margin for a little bit. No. You know, I've heard I, of um, this new I, thing I, called skimp. Inflation. Sorry yes. to interrupt. Have you heard of this? Of course. Yeah. I mean, and I, and yeah. I'm, I might have said this before, but I finally realized it when my dog food and I'm going to create a new benchmark. It's going to be the price of dog food, but <laughs> they cut. Essentially, I'm paying 20 percent more. A few months ago, they lowered it by 10 percent by the amount of actual food and went from 33 pounds to 30 pounds. And then last week I got a uh, notice that it's going up 10 percent in price. So effectively a 20 percent reduction without fully feeling it. But I'm feeling it. No, oh, yeah. Uh, it- Inflation is real. And again, just, you know, this is a numbers channel, right? So something I did the other day, because I'm so annoyed by the CPI calculation, which says rents up 3.2% or whatever it was in their last reading. So I went back and did the hard math, right? And and the actual rent, so rent or cost equivalent or whatever you want to call it, uh, or owner's equivalent, I think they call it owner's equivalent rent uh, is like 23% of CPI. It's the biggest individual component. They they counted at 3.2%. The actual number is somewhere between 16 and 18.9. I took the lowest of the range, which was 16, did all the math, and CPI, the actual reading, just with the correction for rent, is 10.2%. You have fixed rate debt, 30-year debt. It's actually, Mitch, why I spent the last year or so refining all of my apartments into 30-year debt via a non-QM lender, because I don't want to have any interest rate risk in three, four, five years. So, uh, yeah, it's it, you, in real estate, it moves slow enough where if you're observant, you can pivot and change. The stock market can't do it. Crypto can't do it. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm lazy and would much rather focus on a slower moving asset. Well yeah, played, I will say just, uh, uh, You know, I, I once heard this team out of uh, Houston. They currently have like 24 projects in development. They're one of the biggest builders in, in Austin. Anyways, um, I was sitting down with them talking about a deal and the guy says to me, he's like, you know, it's not a bad deal, but I think about return on the headaches. And <laughs> I like, it's like, you know, it's kind of brilliant because once you hit a certain amount of wealth, it, it's less about money and more about time and headaches. And when you think about the stock market, it is, I mean, so many headaches. To real estate, my headaches have been here and there for sure, and, and they can be a pain in the butt. But generally, I have far more headaches with the stock market than I do with real estate. So a metric that no one might be thinking about, but one that I think about quite a bit. Well, I'm going to steal that return on headaches. That, that's yeah. a good one. That's <laughs> <not> great. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, me too. One of the other things uh, I briefly mentioned at the top of the podcast was the diversification to stocks and bonds. Mm. And like I said, this is obviously, you know, the world that I have come from mm-hmm. and the entire idea and really kind of what advisors always pitch to their clients is we've got to have a well-diversified portfolio. So when X is up or down, this one is acting in a different manner and essentially protecting us from any volatile movements. And what we've realized, and the data clearly says this, you can look this up, your advisor's Maybe a little misinformed. You know, they typically have uh, what's called a style box, both in the equity and the fixed income space. So it'll be, it'll look like a tic tac toe little chart there, and they'll have small cap value and small cap blend and small cap growth, and it'll go mid cap, large cap, and then really the same thing on the fixed income side with credit quality and duration. So um, how long those coupons are out there for. And interestingly enough, stocks and bonds, their correlation is right around 0.44. A correlation of one, you move in tandem. A correlation of zero, you don't move at all. And then a negative correlation, you move in an opposite direction. And really what I've seen out there, some of the data is direct real estate actually owning the asset class is a zero correlation. That to me really provides the diversification that an investor needs 
to mitigate that volatile, wild Monday that we saw yesterday. We didn't see any of that owning real estate. Granted, we also don't have, you know, as of a liquid uh, marketplace for that, but we didn't feel that. Mm. No, not at all. This goes back to the volatility, you know, uh, the sharp ratio. I, I can't hammer it enough, but when we're looking at any asset, risk versus return has got to be top of mind, right? You know, in fact, uh, just uh, more specific to Zuber's world, when I get investors saying, well, I can get this property in this D class neighborhood 15% return, it's like, again, an extra hundred bucks for a lot more headaches, you know. So that's a volatile asset in real estate. But if you're buying good assets, fixed debt, as he mentioned, you know, you hold it for 10, 15, 20 years, you're going to be doing just fine. Yeah. The other thing too, what I thought was always interesting, and this is the conversation because a lot of what I do day to day is not just work with accredited investors. Most of my deals, I'm working with family offices, the RIAs in the space who are embracing direct real estate as a portion of their client's investment portfolio. And you know, we always have this conversation. Well, you know, I'm getting my exposure through these publicly traded REITs and even these non-tradable REITs like a Blackstone. But the reality is publicly traded REITs have a correlation of 45. You're yeah. almost getting the exact same correlation as you would in the bond world. So what real diversification other than, you know, the headline and the name of your mutual fund or investment product that says REIT, you're getting exactly the same correlation. So when it comes to diversification, to me, it's diversifying the correlation of how these investments work together. It's not just the name, right? It's the actual correlation. And when you're actually building portfolios, mm -hmm. the portfolio construction correlation is everything. Yeah. Now, the fact of the matter is you're not liquid. And I think that really is, that goes to really kind of understanding each individual investor and knowing what they can yeah. afford well, to not have readily accessible. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's I, also too, just, just to hammer on, on, on the point of cross assets, it's called cross asset correlation, if, I, if I'm correct. The most savvy uh, portfolio managers obviously use this. Um, but one of them, as you may know, is Ray Dalio. He has a great YouTube video about cross asset correlation. And he's all about managing that, you know, that risk versus return, most commonly uh, famous in his all weather portfolio strategy, right? So it's, it's an absolute tidbit that any savvy investor should be thinking about. So, but back to your, your, your next point, Mitch. I wanted to talk about liquidity because that is for some a negative, right? If, if you need fast access to your uh, dollars, real estate's not your, not your thing. Yeah, no question. And we'll talk a little bit more about the liquid illiquidity of, okay. of real estate on the second half of this. We'll, we'll kind of talk about just, you know, the three disadvantages to real estate. And that's certainly probably, in my opinion, the biggest one. But one of my favorite parts, and I think Zuber, you'll be able to give the most amount of insight into this, but the benefits of cash flow when it comes to real estate and what that can do. And that kind of goes back to that rich dad, poor dad book, which was probably the first book that I ever read that was of interest because most books that I read in high school or caught, they were probably pretty boring to me. I would, yeah. This one was the first one that grabbed my attention and said, holy cow. Yeah. And then it also validated everything they teach in school was worthless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. There's certainly some missing aspects to, uh, to high school and college. Yeah, so cash flow is the thing, right? They're, they're, if you want to be rich, you can get there you know, on Wall Street or an athlete or something like that. It's just an income number, but you got to keep working. Cash flow. Cash flow is how I retired at 45. Cash flow is how I replaced two six-figure incomes and have a better lifestyle today. Uh, than I did while working, right? It is about time. Real wealth is about choosing how you spend your time, with whom, when, all of those things. Cash flow does that, right? Uh, and oh, by the way, if you happen to have cash flow built on assets that are also like inflation adjusted and all of that, your lifestyle goes up. As you both know, there's this famous 4% rule, right? Spend 40 years, spend 40 years working 40 hours and then live on 40%. Right? The whole idea is build a $1.9 million nest egg in the market. That's what the most people think you need. And then you just live on 4% of that and hope you don't die or you know, run out of money before you die. That's one way to go. Why don't you spend 10 years building up a real estate portfolio, get fixed rate debt, and then let inflation be your friend? 
right? The only people that won the 1970s and the 1970s sucked, just in case anybody was wondering. Stagflation sucks. Double-digit inflation sucks. But boy, if you own some real estate where rents went up and all these other things, and you had real cash flow, your cash flow at the end of the 70s versus the beginning would be astonishingly different because you had the lowest of the lowest rates, you had uh, the lowest cost structure, and all the cash flow, or at least most of it, would fall to the bottom line, and you were living pretty. So get in the game. It takes a few years, but yeah, it's cash flow is where it's at. Is there a specific number, Zuber, that when you buy an income producing asset, is there a specific number that at least you want as far as that delta between what the actual current rents go for and what your note goes for? Or are no, you buying it all cash? I hope you're not buying cash no. with where <laughs> interest rates are. No, I've actually went back to assets and took cash out. So no, if I can borrow it 4% and earn more. So I don't think about it as a rent number. For me, it all comes down to how hard my money's working. I call it yield, right? I treat every asset like a bond. It's just how my brain works. Some people call it cash on cash. But for me, that's what it is, right? And I've used the same spreadsheet to compare little houses with big apartments. I want to know how hard my money was working. I think there's, again, lots of rules of thumb out there that are just wrong, like bigger is better. Well, bigger is better sometimes. Bigger is not always better. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. And, um, you know, I want to know how hard my money's working. So today I just borrowed 4% on some buildings that I own free and clear because I expect to earn north of 8%. I want to get double, double the rate of capital, cost of capital. So that's what I look for is, is double the cost of capital. That's brilliant. And so when, when you look at some of these real estate investments that are currently producing that income, you mentioned you want to determine yield. Ultimately, you're figuring out how much of invested capital that it took. And then you're, you know, really, well, the other way around, dividing the cash flow of that property and dividing it by the total yeah. amount invested. Yeah, it's really a simple math. This is a numbers channel, right? The denominator or the bottom number is down payment, closing cost, and make ready. This is something I did wrong in the beginning is I bought junk and didn't include make ready, right? Which is fixing up all of that. So all of that's the denominator, right? How much money comes out of my bank account to buy that asset and control it and make it rent ready? And then the, the top number is simply uh, monthly true cash flow times 12, right? Produces a yearly number, do the math, convert to a percentage and you're there. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, that's all it is. And every market has their average. This is the problem back to Tom's point about people going to D-class areas in Ohio or Michigan or wherever it is. You can go broke buying cheap. Excel lies. So I tell people you need to spend 60 or 90 days learning your buy box. You need to only answer one question. And that is what's an average deal. Once you spend 60 or 70 or 80 or 90 days, whatever it takes in your buy box, your only job going forward is to do good or great deals. If average is six, go do eight or nine. If average is 10, go do 11 and 12. There are so many properties on the market. You don't, don't, don't bother doing average. Average sucks. Spend the time, find the one or two great deals and get going. So that, that's what I talk about and teach all the time. You know, recently I had an income producing property that was cash flowing quite nicely. In fact, you know, the cash on cash was over 20%. Okay. Granted, I've owned this asset for a long time. It naturally makes sense. You're probably not, you know, I recently did a, a further evaluation on what it would cost a new investor. And that number was closer to 8%, which makes sense. But just because of my acquisition cost was very low. Sure. But at what point do you actually want to say, you know what, let me do some calculations of potentially disposing of this asset mm -hmm. and looking at the next opportunity, you know, at what point do you decide to sell? So I mm -hmm. recently did that for me. It was one of those deals where, you know what, if I sell, I could take those existing, that existing free cash that I'm going to get from this deal and I can deploy it at a higher velocity from what I'm getting today. Yeah, I think that's an interesting way to look at it. Everybody had, can do their thing. That's not how I would look at it. So I think there's a couple of things and I've done them both, right? I've sold, ten, or sold slash 1031. That's the same thing. Uh, and I've done cash out refinances on assets with low basis and actually free and clear. So there's a couple of things. The most important thing for me is, will it be a better return, right? Is, is it going to be meaningfully different? If the asset I own, for example, is earning eight and I think I can get 10, that's not meaningfully different. 
because eight is certain, or at least as certain as it can be, and 10 is living in Excel. You just don't know what surprises can happen. Now, if it was 16%, that might be interesting, right? It's like, okay, 16, maybe it's 12, it's, it's meaningful. What I actually do when I decide to sell is I don't think about those numbers at all. What I really think about is, is the asset I currently own, is somebody going to overpay? So like I wrote in my book, One Rental at a Time, I was trying to buy that ninth house. Let's go through the details. The first house I bought, Norris Drive, bought for 107, rented for 1100. Cash flow, fine, right? Especially with 20% down. Uh, lo and behold, three or three and a half years later, that same house on the same street is selling for 265. Unfortunately, it still rents for 1100. No bueno, no good, right? So I can't buy anything. So now things are unaffordable, right? The unaffordability or the affordability index is crashing in my market. So I sell, I sell every house or 1031 every house. Now go back to 2019, something different. Bigger is better is all the rage. And Grant Cardone has everybody looking at apartments. I happen to own a C-class of building that I bought ARI 1031 into. I had lots of equity. It needed uh, about 20% of the purchase price in immediate investment. It was a section eight C-class building. It was a headache to manage. It was still cash flowing because of my basis, I was fine. But somebody wanted to overpay for that because bigger is better. They got a bunch of friends together and they overpaid. So I sold and I actually sold. I didn't 1031 because I couldn't find anywhere to put my money. I paid the IRS. It's okay, right? It's fine, right? You don't, you don't go broke taking profit. I would have loved to 1031, but I'm not going to do a bad deal. Uh, so that's kind of how I think when to sell. I, I'm really a buy and hold forever, but if you want to overpay for anything I own, you could, you could take it. It's hard to do a 1031 in stocks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I mean, you can write off losses that you didn't foresee to offset gains, but there's no sort of tax vehicle like that. So There's a reason why your podcast and your book is called One Rental at a Time, right? And so <laughs> it totally makes sense. That actually brings us to the last advantage that I think exists in, in real estate, which is the tax advantage. And you obviously brought up a 1031, but I'd love to hear a little bit about kind of your thoughts. You know, we, we know about kind of the potential to offset annual losses, which really don't translate to actual investor losses, but let's talk a little bit about that. Tom, I think you'd be yeah. Yeah, look, I'm gonna, gonna offer some great insight here. Yeah, um, and I'll let Zuber fill in too, but just yesterday I had a conversation with two investors um, and I'm always helping them. One, I, I want to understand their situation. You know, does their partner work? Do they not work? Um, where they are, they're at in their, in their journey. And again, one thing people don't consider enough is the beauty of our tax system, right? Real mm -hmm. estate was, uh, again, uh, Kiyosaki has the cash flow quadrant and he shows that in that quadrant, investors and business owners are incentivized from a tax standpoint by W-2 earners and the sole proprietors, right? Mm -hmm. What that means is you get tax breaks, beautiful tax breaks if you own real estate. Uh, one of them is depreciation. And I'll let Zuber kind of hit on that as to how that's helped him and his apartment uh, holdings. But it's absolutely a metric that any savvy investor has to consider um, quarter to quarter, year to year. And I'll stop there. So what I would say about depreciation, I would actually go back to what kind of Tom brought up our tax system. If you ever needed incentive to understand real estate, know the fact that Congress collectively owns a lot of real estate. And why do I bring that up? Well, people are people. And yes, our Congress folks, even though they're giving and self, blah, 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 they're going to do things that help them and their families. Lo and behold, the Trump Tax Act or Jobs Act or whatever it's called, had this wonderful thing called bonus depreciation. And there's this you know, thing that has been used a lot of time by the big guys called cost segregation that has now been brought to the little guys. So I know of several real estate professionals, and now that you have to do work to qualify for that, who have seven figure years that will be writing off everything because of cost segregation and bonus depreciation. Go ahead and look those up. It's a wonderful tax yeah, and, system. And, yeah, and, and, and Zuber too, um, similar to a company, something called carry forward loss. Exactly. Right? If you have leftover depreciation, you can take it to the next year to help run off of those gains. So again, it's just, it's just a wonderful asset when it comes to tax strategy. And so when I'm talking to my investors, it's like, look, what's your tax planning strategy? If you don't have one, get that first. I mean, geez. Mm -hmm. And talk to an expert. Tom, you had somebody great, I think, was it Brent Hall? 
Brandon Hall, yeah, he's a the real estate CPA. Happy to make the introduction if you give us an email. Yeah, he, he does work with higher net worth individuals, just being transparent. And um, so find somebody in your you. local market that yeah, you, find you might CPA have an that, opportunity there. I think that could be a great idea. Uh, yeah, any CPA knows about bonus appreciation. I mean, it's so obvious nowadays. But yeah, I mean, it takes an hour of your time to talk about this. I mean, geez. So phenomenal advantages. We talked about the ability to offer absolute returns, the hedge against inflation, the diversification among stocks and bonds. Although I do think folks do need to own some stocks and bonds. Absolutely. The benefit of those monthly cash flows, where else are you getting yield today? It's not coming from your fixed income investments. It's next to nothing, probably not keeping up with the rate of inflation at all. Uh, if you think about it, and it's probably a losing asset, you think it's a safe asset, but the reality is you're probably not making much. Uh, you're actually losing money, uh, lose, losing purchasing power, I should say. And then the potential tax advantages. But let's talk about some of the challenges of real estate. Heterogeneity. I don't know if I said that right, <laughs> but that's my best stab at it. Okay. And ultimately, what that means is not all of the real estate investments are the same, right? Every single real estate investment is different. So you could, you know, Zuber, you've done a really good job. You've got your spreadsheet there that you've been using since day one, and you can apply it to each individual real estate investment. But the reality is these are all different deals. Oh, no, without question. Every line is a different deal. Uh, and again, it takes time, folks. This is not, I, I've looked at my market every day for 21 years now. And it probably took six months because I never even lived in my market, never spent the night in my market, right? It takes time to learn this stuff. Every asset stands alone. Every asset is compared to the others. Expense structure, rent, value add, areas, easy to turn over. I mean, every deal is different. I hate rules of thumb. Rules of thumb don't work in real estate. Like for example, my best asset over the last 21 years has been shockingly 512 square foot single family home on a quarter acre lot. It was built in the 1920s. Same person's lived there. I think I've had one maintenance call in 18 years. It's never, never moved, never a problem, never missed a payment. Without question, the best asset I've owned is a 512 square foot single family home. It sounds like the Toyota Camry of real estate. <laughs> Believe me, if I if I only had one thing to buy, I'd buy all the little houses in my market. I could, but uh, thankfully, I could buy anything I want. Brilliant. One of the other disadvantages, I think, is what's referred to as lumpiness. And you know, when you go out and purchase any traded asset, mm -hmm. like a stock or a bond or even crypto, mm -hmm. whatever amount of money that you've got in the bank or liquid, you can go out and actually buy that asset. If I've got $100, I can buy $100 worth of a stock. It's not going to be much, mm -hmm. but I can do that. Mm -hmm. I can't really do that in real estate. And so you do need to have a specific set amount, allocated amount to go out and, and purchase the asset that you want to purchase. Yeah. I mean, we'll even go one step further. A lot of people in the real estate game will poo-poo that, right? Because I technically have done zero down deals and all of that. So you can build your network. You can find these corner cases and markets are different. That said, if you don't have an emergency fund set aside for real estate, you're going to go broke because bad stuff happens. Mother nature is a pain. People, people break stuff. If you don't have an emergency fund, which is like real money set aside, you're going to lose your assets eventually. But no, I agree with you. You need the problem with the real estate is it takes cash to get started. Sure, when you're in the game long enough and you got a network and a reputation, you could do zero down deals. But people that pitch that strategy are being disingenuous. I could not have done a zero down deal probably for the first eight or nine years. Have I done them? Absolutely. I bought an apartment zero down. That's not something you're going to do as a rookie investor. And to sell that vision is to be disingenuous. So I agree with you. It takes some scratch. But that's part of the game, right? You've got to take, you got to sacrifice, live below your means. Uh, if you want to make work optional in 10 years, it's going to take work. It's your call. Yeah. Yeah. I think those are great points that you made, Zuber. We talked about this before, and this is the most important consideration in investing in real estate and the disadvantages is the liquidity. 
Mm-hmm. And obviously they're, they're, they are liquid. It's just not a daily instant liquidity as a publicly traded instrument. And so, mm-hmm. you know, you want to put a house or an asset on the market, you know, it's going to take some time to find a buyer, although not much these days. Mm-hmm. I think I had an offer in, in three days. And then ultimately, you're going to go through the inspection and the option periods of these different assets. And obviously, the bigger the asset class, you talked about apartment buildings, you know, that option period now looks like a 60 or 90 days. And uh, Tom, you look at some of the land developments that those deals that you look at, they're, they're much longer. And so it's not as easy as just, you know, getting on your app and and selling your investment. Although for the right price, I'm sure you could probably get daily liquidity. If I dropped an asset far enough, I'm sure somebody would come along and and pay cash and I'd have the money in my pocket tomorrow and I probably just wouldn't command market value. Yeah. Well, there's actually, this is actually a very important one because you need to know yourself. So myself, right? I almost called myself Zuber in the third person. Boy, that was going to be weird. Uh, (laughs) But so back to my stock trading days where I turned seven into 200 and 200 into 40, right? That whole cycle. What did I learn about myself? I am an emotional investor. I don't have systems and processes. I'm emotion-based. And that means I do dumb stuff. (laughs) I was going to use a different word, but I do dumb stuff. So I've come to real estate and it is not as liquid. So I have had moments. I remember one triplex that comes to mind, uh, like 2016 to 18, we had seven turnovers in a, in a triplex. That's not good. Just some, un, some unlucky things and this, that, the other, if I would have had the same liquidity, I would have sold that thing and I would have lost a hundred thousand bucks. Yeah. We kept it because I had to, I couldn't sell it. I didn't do this. I did. So I love the fact it's illiquid for me as a personal investor. I'm emotion-based. I know who I am. And the fact that real estate is ill liquid is awesome for me. Yeah. By the way, Zuber, um, about the emotion thing, I'm reading a book by Malcolm Gladwell, if you know who that is, called mm-hmm. Blink. Mm-hmm. And for all you out there, a quick plug. Mm-hmm. And um, it's surprising how an EQ person like yourself can make the right decisions without doing any of the analytics behind it. So um, <laughs> it's worked out for you. So there you go. You. There you go. I feel better. Thank you. <laughs> Super. I wanted to add, I love how you know thyself and you can look at yourself and know that you act on emotions and the fact that real estate prevents you from, from acting. And that, you know, from somebody like myself who comes and knows all financial behaviors and preach the right behaviors for other people, we're human. Yeah. It's, it's inherently in our DNA to run from investments, which is what happened in the stock market yesterday, right? You had all of these sellers, primarily retail folks, the Reddit folks who were, I can't take anymore. They said, uncle, they sold. And the nice thing is all these institutions are sitting on records amounts of cash came in and said, we'll buy that. This is a great discount. Thank you very much. And you had a feeding frenzy from from the institution. So Mm -hmm. I thought that point about protecting yourself from not being able to sell at the wrong time. Yeah, I think we're just, we're human. So it's what we're going to want to do. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, speed, money, emotions, mistakes, all these things we eat at ourselves. One of the other things I'll say about this is if your portfolio is keeping you up at night, that's a sign. Yeah. And, yeah. And how many of you are staying up at night because of this or that? And if you're in crypto and you're trading on margin, I just want to say right now, you're an idiot because you're going to get washed out. They're going to, they're going to eat your lunch. Yeah. Yeah. You could have an expletive in front of that idiot as well. Yeah. And yeah. that works for me. That's a technical term. Uh, only <laughs> discussed. You'll, you'll find that in the CFA handbook. Um, so, you know, what, what, thing I, I did want to uh, add to that is leverage because, you know, real estate is highly levered. Mm-hmm. And, you know, w- when you look at most, you know, single family homes, for those folks that are building out those, you know, rental properties one by one, you're levered. And most mm-hmm. folks are probably, you know, 75 LTV is probably a normal, um, maybe a little bit more, less, just depending on everyone's mm-hmm. individual situation. But one of the things there is in, rising market 
that we're in today, it works mm -hmm. out really well. Mm -hmm. But when things go the other way, and eventually they will, you know, real estate is an inelastic product and eventually uh, supply will meet the demand. It'll, it'll pass by and just in a blink of an eye, it'll go the other direction mm -hmm. and things could get really ugly when you're levered. And, you yeah. know, it is something that I think is another disadvantage that we didn't really mention, but we went there and, and it could really hurt your overall portfolio. Well, let's talk about that because yes and no. Mathematically speaking, sure, but it also depends on your debt. So we, we have to piece this apart. So let's first talk about residential. So four units and below. Inside residential loans, assuming you do what I talk about, which is 30 year fixed rate debt, it does not matter what the asset is worth once the, uh, once the loan is done, as long as you make payments. There were plenty of residential properties that fell by 50% that were not foreclosed on because the owner was making the payment, right? They got to live somewhere. Residential debt, 30 year fixed rate mortgage wipes away that concern. Assuming you're getting positive cash flow, you're not betting on negative cash flow yeah. or appreciation. Assuming you're doing what I teach, you're going to be just fine. It doesn't matter. Now, why did Mike Zuber spend a year or nine months refining every apartment into 30-year fixed rate debt? Because commercial lending is different. And this is why I think commercial lending is about to blow up office, retail, and yes, even multifamily. Because inside the commercial loans, first off, 25-year AM versus 30, which does affect payment. But usually there's three, five, or seven-year terms where you are forced to refinance. And if you refi into an environment with higher interest rates and flat or negative rents, your value calculation is going to be all wonky, and you may have to cut a check. And heaven forbid you're in an, an LP, in a GP, in a bigger property, they can come to you and do a capital raise. I am not touching any of that junk. Because there are stupid deals being done today. Yeah. That I'm like, what are you guys doing? Zuber. Right. By the way, so um, an analyst that if you're into real estate, you should be watching is Ivy Zellman. She's been hitting some taglines recently that are more the pop culture sort of research. If you look at her real research, her biggest scare right now is in the multifamily syndications. Yeah, to it your should point, be. It's crazy. 100%. To your point, uh, their pro forma is they acquire the property you know, at a at an 8% cap, they go to sell at a 5% cap. Not a huge spread, right? And their, and their debt structure was probably based on a four, maybe 5% rate. Well, that's gonna go to six, six and a half, maybe 7% now, right? So that, that spread probably collapses, very risky. Uh, two, a lot of these loans, again, single family, non-recourse. They can't, if, if as long as you're paying the payments, they will come after you. In commercial, they will come after you. Recourse is a real thing. Now it's becoming less and less, as I'm seeing in my deals, uh, you can have these bad boy carve outs, as they call it. But in general, recourse loans are, are still a thing in commercial. And to your point, they will come after you to liquidate the asset if they need to. Well, again, oh, by the way, where are you finding multifamily at an 8% cap? Yeah. Can uh, you yeah, exactly. get on that ASAP? Because I just saw, we just had Craig Berger on here from Avid Real Estate on the last episode. And he just purchased a property in Houston in the threes. Yeah. But yeah. I was actually surprised because one of the ways that I do my underwriting and analysis of a deal, it was well below market value. So although the cap rate wasn't attractive, the undervalued rents I thought were extremely attractive. So right. yeah, not all deals, even though are expensive or fair market, there could still be meat on the bone there as sure. long as those performers are, are done right. But yeah, I think, you know, just depending on the property, I think class A is probably tough. Just like you mentioned, class C is a, a probably just, you've got more of a spread and more of an opportunity for upside. Now, you do have some risk involved just because of the, the nature of the tenant. So, but you look at the nature of the tenant, they tend to be workforce housing, mm -hmm. but then you look at where we are with how tight we are in the employment markets. And, 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 you know, the fact that those folks are probably going to have a gig and they're probably going to start making some more money. Well, so these are all things we have to watch out. So again, I, I, if you're getting eight caps today, go nuts. I've actually yeah. seen deals in the under four as you, cause I'm an accredited investor. I By the way, lots, totally lots for deals. example. Yeah, I know. I know. We're, we're just, <laughs> I haven't seen it either. We're just, let's pick up, let's pick on Tom. Yeah. We're just, yeah. We're, I haven't yeah. seen it either. 
you're, you're that guy today. We're picking on you. But I've seen some very dangerous things. There are some deals that I've out there that I actually think we're going to go into a recession and unemployment or unemployment's going to turn around. So the fact that we're at 3.9 today, participation rate, all that. So I don't know that end of this year or next year is very good. I think we have a recession, but that's a different story. If your GP is buying something sub four and telling you the exit is to get the cap rate to two and a half, run away from that deal. Yep. Run away. Totally. And, and there are people doing that. I have seen presentations where they're going to take an asset at four and their plan is to get the cap rate down to three. Folks, in a rising environment, the risk adjusted return of three is, and it, so it, you, get a, you get a 10 year pretty yeah. soon at three. It's, yeah. And this is why Audrey Zellman, uh, famously known for her call, the OA crash, um, mm-hmm. is so scared of that market. It's like, it's just too tight right now. Way too much risk. Too much money. Which is why if you're going that route, development just seems like a safer bet there. And although you may not see a preferred rate of return or you're clipping some sort of a yield, it is probably safer because the cost to build versus the relative cap price, you know, you're probably going to get a few points of delta there. So thanks, Mitch. But I'll tell you, supply chain is still a headache. (laughs) Yeah. Well, hey, supply chain and permitting, it's never fun. Guys, this has been enlightening for our listeners. I hope that you go out and listen to Zuber one deal at a time. Rental at a time. Sorry. It's all right. Guys, go listen to Zuber. It was a pleasure having you on here. Tom, it's always good seeing you. Till next time. Thanks for listening.